Thanks, folks. Um, so if you've seen my DerbyCon talk, you'll see some familiar content at the beginning. Uh, it's been a long running project, so I've been using bits of it as I go. Um, there's some new content, new stuff, uh, and I'm trying to make a little more AppSec focus for this. Uh, so again, bear with me if you think it's the duplicate content. There actually is some new stuff here. Uh, so first off, the whole goal of this talk is to take um, large-scale data analysis about the whole internet, like the real internet, not some cooked results someone else puts together, um, and shake it all about and dump out some vulnerabilities in zero day. Uh, and then go fix them, basically. So that's the, that's the plan. Uh, if you look at you know, any IP address, any IPv4 address at least, it's a 32-bit number. It starts at zero, goes to 4.2 billion. Um, it's a pretty finite space. Um, it's not really nothing that magic about IP addresses. They're pretty, they're pretty easy to, to manage. So if you're looking at the internet as a to-do list, like I do, uh, you start at zero and you go to 4.2 billion, and then you're done. And you keep doing that for protocols and services. Uh, you've seen some, probably some different maps of the internet so far. Here's a pretty famous topology map of the Opti folks. This shows all the connectivity between different routers, different networks. Um, the green here are commercial, the red's military, the blue are orgs. Uh, and just one way to kind of visualize what the internet actually looks like with those 4.2 billion you know, IPs. And granted, not all 4.2 billion are active, but, or addressable, but it gives you an idea of, kind of how folks have looked at it in the past. Um, there's been some other work recently on uh, showing the internet connectivity as peering points between cities. So the top graph will show you the density of peering points by city across the world. The bottom graph will show you the connectivity between those points. So another way of kind of looking at the same thing about how these different um, cities and regions actually interconnect and where kind of the hot spots are. So you can see by this graph alone that if you want to say take out you know, a particular country or city's internet access, you're trying to find how they actually get their internet, um, there's only a fairly small number of peering points for most cities outside of the major um, metropolis areas uh, if you're planning on taking them offline. So especially stuff down in Australia, down in kind of the Pacific and so on. Another graph, this is uh, now done by content. So instead of looking at this from a perspective of topology or connectivity, uh, looking at the internet again, but this time based on uh, what the biggest websites are. So the blue dots here in the center, these represent uh, North American, you know, kind of more international, uh, more you know, uh, cross, cross boundary, uh, sorry, cross national uh, popular websites like Google, uh, Bing, things like that. Um, so this is where Facebook will show up, this is where other sites will show up. Um, on the left hand side here, you've got uh, various Chinese sites like Baidu and so on that represent the big sites for the Chinese language uh, internet users. And the little red dots on the right side there, those are all uh, Russian and Russian language. So this gives you an idea of kind of, if you're looking at uh, capturing traffic for internet users, or you're looking at kind of how important a particular website is, uh, you can easily see this on this graph. If you're planning on you know, sniffing, or you know, let's say you can do DNS poisoning, and you want to DNS poison to get the most traffic, to get the most connectivity, um, there's only a very few number of websites you have to actually target to get a large portion of the population, a large portion of the daily web traffic. Um, so for example, DNS poisoning, Google and Facebook probably get you about 80% of the US in terms of the day-to-day -day web browsing. So again, I'm looking at all this stuff as kind of a target list. Like, if I was uh, you know, a bad guy and I was trying to attack this stuff or take it offline or steal data or whatever it is, where are the, kind of the big targets? How do they connect to everything else? Uh, where's, you know, what does this stuff actually mean? You, if there's actually uh, a weakness here, let's try to find it based on where it lives and how important it is, not just based on you know, what, the, what Nessa says about it. So the, where I want to go with this is saying, okay, we've got these great maps, and I've got these great interconnectivity, these topology graphs, but how do we actually find data? How do we actually figure out what these things are running and get some detailed granular data about services on these systems? Um, there's you know, great services out there like Shodan. There's been some other research projects out there as well. Um, one of the oldest ones is the BAS from 1998. These guys uh, scanned 36.4 million sites. They found something like over 450,000 uh, hosts that were exploitable using just 18 different exploits. Um, and this ratio hasn't really changed much over the years. If anything, it's gotten worse. Um, at the time, there's only 36.4 million websites that could find through DNS lookups. These days, there's quite a bit more. Uh, but the ratio of vulnerabilities just hasn't really changed that much. We're still just as screwed as we always were. Uh, Shodan's been a great way to demonstrate that. Shodan, if, for folks who aren't familiar, is a website that lets you search for computers. So you can say, look at this IP range, look at this port number, look at this string, tell me everything that matches that based on his scan results and the things he's put into his database. So there's lots of really neat data there. Uh, you can easily do a quick breakdown of services. He's got over 80 million web servers, a bunch of UPnP, SNP, and secure shell now. Um, when I first started this project, Shodan was missing a lot of uh, services that I was looking for. Like I wanted to look at SNP data, but Shodan didn't include it at the time, or they only a very small amount of it. So since the project's kicked off, uh, John and I worked together to, you know, one, start goading him into scanning more stuff, but two, also sharing data and techniques and stuff. So originally when I looked at the project, uh, Shodan was 90% HTTP and HTTPS, and that was it. So I was like, great, if I want to look at web traffic, I can do lots of cool things, or web servers, but if I'm actually looking at you know, UPnP devices, embedded servers, home devices, you know, routers, things like that. You don't really get good data out of just web scanning. Uh, so I want to take that a little bit further. So I want to start looking at things like MDNS and UPnP, 
uh, VNC, MySQL, things like that. And I've got a little bit short on time today just from the time slot size. So I'm going to go a little bit quick through the stuff. Uh, so step one is scan everything. So scan the net, check. Um, if you want to scan it, it's pretty, you know, pretty cheap to do so. Um, seven or six, you know, seven bucks basically gets you a server that can scan the entire internet in 24 hours for a given port of uh, UDP. If you're doing TCP, it takes a little bit longer than that, but uh, like five or 10 X is long, depending on what you're doing. Um, if you want to use NMAP for it, NMAP works great. You can basically take NMAP, do the bulk SIN scanning, tie that into an NSC engine to scrape whatever data you want from open services and do it all in one big step. So NMAP is actually capable of doing about 50,000 hosts per second per core on most servers these days if you tune it properly. So if you think, hey, NMAP takes too long, it's too slow, well, you're doing it wrong. Look at the manual, tweak the timeouts. You can actually get it to uh, cover slash 16s in a minute and a half if you want to. There's some pretty crazy stuff you can do with it. Um, if you want to look at any of the tools that I use to generate the data, a lot of that stuff's online at this URL, just GitHub, critical R slash scan tools. Um, so this is all the package generators, the blasting tools, things like that. Um, and there's a little quick bare bones EDP blaster we didn't see that all it does is spew up packets at crazy rates and receive the raw resp responses, write them back out to a standard app. So you use this almost like a, a, a network pipe, basically. You feed it packets on one side, and it, you feed it IPs on one side, and it spits out responses on the other. And you can basically scan an entire slash, slash 16 in about a minute and a half with this as well. Um, actually, sorry, you can scan an entire slash A with this in a minute and a half. Uh, so, you know, 16.7 million IPs. You can go pretty damn quick with this thing. Um, and the great thing about this is this tool runs just fine on 128 meg VPS server in Russia uh, with a very cheap, almost, you know, free plan, if you will. So a lot of folks are provisioning VPS servers based on, uh, you know, CPU or RAM. But if you're just using network traffic, you're just basically sending out network probes, uh, you can utilize the awesome hardware running these things at the network level, like the EE Pro cards and things like that, without paying for those resources, you know, above that. Uh, so for very little amounts of money, you can scan the entire internet and do something terrible. Uh, we looked at how fast worms like Blaster uh, spread and things like that. Um, any kind of UDP-based attack, you can basically knock, you know, hit every, every system on the internet for about five or six bucks in about 24 hours, 18 if you really tune it. Um, and that's kind of where attackers are today with capabilities. Uh, doing all this stuff, I managed to send lots of traffic and basically run out of bandwidth pretty quick. So I was pushing about 1.2 gigs of traffic a day just sending UDP probes off one server. So it can get pretty intensive pretty quick. Um, got lots of complaints. I'm really good at pissing people off apparently. I got 2,300 of these complaints in about five months. Um, people call me all sorts of fun names and uh, I've got two ISPs that have been pretty good at um, you know, uh, not kicking me off after I get lots of complaints. Um, in the case of Single Hop, they've got these two, you know, actually now three wonderful abuse support staff living in Ukraine. And when I called Single Hop Chicago office, said, hey, I, got, I want to send a gift to these guys. They're like, oh yeah, send to Chicago. I'm like, wait, this doesn't look like a Chicago name. <laughs> sort of, so I found them on Facebook, found out where they live, got their at-home addresses and some of the gift packages there and it was much easier. So now my buddies in the abuse department take care of me, it's great. So uh, go Single Hop. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to look at some of the bizarre feedback I've gotten from scanning the internet, I get lots of people trying to report me to the cops and saying, you know, you're breaking the law and various state attorney generals calling me and swearing at me, things like that. So uh, it's been fun so far, but to be honest, I'm not really breaking the law, not really crossing any legal boundaries in the U.S. at least. Uh, so you find some really weird responses. Uh, in one case, a, a state agency said, hey, we got a DDoS. Is this somehow related to your attack? I'm like, no, man, I'm sending like four probes. Like, get over it. <laughs> this is not DDoS. Uh, so it's been fun to kind of see the responses. There's this. Uh, uh, physicists in Denmark that likes to report me to US CERT once a day. So they get lots and lots of complaints by this one crazy old man who knows physics really well. But it's been uh, fun doing it all. Uh, stored so far about five months, so around 830 gigs of data. If you actually decompress it all, it's probably about two and a half terabytes now. Um, if you normalize it and, and really crunch it down, you've got 450 gigabytes of VZIP2. So that's about what the data size looks like. Um, it's all a Mongo database, Elasticsearch in the back end for querying this stuff. And I do a lot of like text files and Ruby and pipes and running parallel and things like that. Um, one server's got 98 gigs of RAM and 16 cores, sorry, 12 cores. Other server has 198 gig, 192 gigs of RAM and uh, 16 cores. And then it's crunch data all day long, reloading data, tweaking it, getting data out of it. So one of the things that took a while with this talk was getting all the results exported out on time. So, you know, processing something like two and a half billion records take, takes a while. Um, so uh, that's kind of where I am with the data set. I want to skip right ahead to the results because I know we don't have too much time today. Uh, first off, is, as far as the service breakdown goes, um, the number one most popular service on the internet is the web. It's the web, we call it the web for a reason because it's mostly web. So something like 91 million HTTP servers on port 80 have been indexed so far by these scans. And this is just doing random IPs out of a bucket with NMAP and scanning them until I find results and then putting them back in and repeating the process. So there's results in this, there's you know, definitely duplication across this stuff, but these are 91 million unique IP addresses that are found. Uh, total results have around 200 million responses just for HTTP over the last five months. Um, what's surprising to me is the second most uh, prevalent service was UPnP, which is the service most people don't really deal with every day. 
but nearly every home broadband router expo exposes the SSDP service and uh, port 1900 UDP to the world. Um, and that also tells you the SOAP endpoint that you can then use to do things like map ports back into the firewall and generally do terrible things. Um, the worst thing about all this is UPnP service. There's only about 12 different unique implementations of UPnP for these stacks out there. And almost all of them are derived from the Intel SDK of UPnP devices, which has tons and tons of vulnerabilities. And no one's ever reported any. There are no CVs for it, but grep-r scanf is hilarious. Uh, so if, if you're looking at, like, if I want to find the most easy way to own the entire internet, uh, you can pop 53 million boxes now just by finding one vulnerability in the UPnP stack and then doing that in 24 hours from a Russian VPS node. So there's your $7 own the internet hack if you want it. Um, <laughs> so going down from that to the rest of the services, see the green ones here are 8080 and 443. Uh, 161 UDP, that's SNP with public read community string. There's 43 million unique IPs with SNP open with public. And there's actually more now that I've finished, you know, the last month or so of scans, but this is a, a little bit stale on the data side. Um, so this is blew me away. We have 43 million machines out there that have SNP read only, and SNP tells you all kinds of crazy stuff about systems that, you know, you don't want to expose to the world, let alone uh, across that many devices. So we'll go into more of the results here as we go forward, but just those are some of the kind of top level findings. Um, at the time I put this together, it's about <coughs> excuse me, 227 million unique IP addresses, about 550 million unique TCP and UDP banners. If you do that based on timestamp plus banner, it breaks down to around uh, 1.6 or 7 billion records so far, and then 2 billion total because there's some duplicate responses. Um, scan every IP on the internet for UDP services every seven hours for five months, and I change what port it is uh, through a little algorithm that cycles through it. So I'll do 137 more frequently than I'll do uh, 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 161 because they want to be able to track NetBIOS devices on the internet as they move around, things like that. Uh, so TCP's mostly been random sampling, but it's enough that I'm actually getting duplicate results from most servers at this point. So I know I'm getting pretty good coverage just by doing random IPs. Uh, and if you look at the total web services, there's around 145 million uh, unique results and about 200 million total just for HTTP, so probably around 285 million across all those other services um, with the data I'm looking at today. So one graph I want to talk about real quick is what I call like an internet spark line. Like if you look at the, IP, the IPv4 address space, starting at zero and going to 4.2 billion, and you lay it out in a just straight spark line graph, the far left side is zero, the far right side is 255, 255, 255, 255, and you see the big end block of it, it's mostly empty, that's all your reserve space, it's not gonna be used. Um, if you're gonna try to find Google's DNS server, it's right there kind of off to the left, sorry, off to your uh, left, and then you know, our IP address from this particular conference is popping up right there in the middle um, to give an idea of kind of where things line up. And all the little you know, peaks and valleys across this are the density of services per slash 16. So just give me some background, I'm gonna show a couple graphs that are based on this. In this case, this is mail servers. So early on I was trying to figure out, is it worth scanning for POP3 servers, IMAP servers across the entire internet, or should I just scan you know, a smaller number of ports? Because obviously the less ports you have to scan, the more data you're gonna get, the more coverage you're gonna have, more, more frequently it'll be updated. Uh, so what I found is there's a direct one-to-one -one correlation between FTP and everything else. So you just look at this graph and like, okay, well for this sub net, there's, you're almost guaranteed to have SNTP if you have any of these other four services open on it. So if you're trying to find mail servers, don't bother with these other four services, just scan SNTP, then scan the boxes that have that open, you know, save yourself a whole lot of time finding services. Uh, so it's one of those things where I looked at this, went crap, I just wasted a ton of time scanning ports I really just didn't need to scan because they're almost a one-to-one -one correlation across these graphs. So you start doing kind of like vertical slices across these graphs or finding direct correlation between services. One of the things that's interesting about here is, uh, interesting with this graph, is if you look at POP3 and IMAP, for example, you see this big spike right in the middle, um, and then below that for POP3S, IMAP best, you don't see that spike. So those are systems that have um, you know, uh, 143 and 110 open, but don't have 993 and 95 open. So anyways, it's, it's mostly data wonk stuff, but it's kind of fun just seeing how this stuff correlates. Um, so this is just kind of a starting example. When you start looking at how other services line up, you start finding some really fun things that pop up. So HTTP and HTTPS pretty much line up pretty well. You'll see a lot less HTTPS and HTTP, but generally in the same ranges. Um, if you look at 8080 below that, it's a little bit different. You see some stuff that's 8080, but not really dense with port 80 or 443. There's trying to be management interfaces on network devices, things like that. Um, FTP, you see big spikes, and they typically correlate with you know, lots of web servers, lots of other devices out there. Um, you get down to Telnet, and you see a lot less of it. Telnet's almost the inverse of web servers. Uh, most systems with Telnet open are routers that don't have a web server exposed, it, with some exceptions in some of the uh, Asian ranges, because you have a lot of uh, network devices that have both web management interfaces and Telnet open. Um, so if you know what your, what your IP address is, convert it to an integer, and you can find it on the chart pretty quick in terms of where your range is. But what I want to point out about this graph, what kind of surprised me, if you look at ScareShell, ScareShell is about uh, half as much as either FTP or Telnet. We're still using unencrypted management protocols more than we are using ScareShell by far. So, yep, we still have all the security we had in 1998, and it's not really getting any better. Um, this is a little bit different graph. It's the same top three protocols for web, so 80, 80, 80, 443. 
and he starts seeing how these line up, and then he starts seeing how, how do those correlate to UP, so UDP services like NetBIOS, SNMP, and UPMP. Um, the crazy thing about this graph is SNMP and UPMP are almost one to one. That's just crazy. I mean, there are, you see some spikes here where there isn't as much UPMP or as much SNMP, but if you look at the very first, very beginning line right there, that's a ton of devices on the one zero, two zero, three zero ranges uh, that have UPMP and SNMP exposed to the world. Um, and as you see that kind of going across the line, they don't really correlate with HTTP or HTTPS or ADAD because these aren't necessarily web servers, they're mostly just network devices, DSL modems, things like that. Um, so it's kind of fun seeing all this stuff. The really scary thing about this graph is the very bottom line here, the NetBIOS graph, these are Windows devices. I extracted all the systems that had Mac out of small zeros, which correlates to, to Samba. So all your Unix boxes pulled them off. These are only Windows servers connected to the internet with no firewall. So everyone talks about how there's nothing in the perimeter anymore. You can only hack web servers. Web apps are the only real attack surface. Well, it's not always the case because you have a lot of Windows boxes just floating out there for some reason or another. And they're not just distributed across, you know, they're not just in Asia, they're not just in, you know, emerging markets or brick. You see them kind of all the way across the board. You see public subnets, people just exposed with their, you know, Windows laptop plugged in, no firewall enabled. So we talk about how even though firewalls are default on an XP, SP3, default on in 7, default on in Vista, default on in 2008, it doesn't really make that much of an impact when it comes to how many Windows machines are actually tied to their, their firewalls. Um, and a great, the nice thing about this is you can actually pull the MAC addresses of those devices as well through uh, the NFLS lookup. And that's where it starts getting fun, researching metrics on what type of devices they are and other cool things with it. Uh, you can actually pull someone's MAC address and basically track them across the internet as they keep popping up in different IP ranges by correlating the MAC address across all your data set over months. Another stretch of the same data is taking the zone age defacements. Uh, the folks there were nice enough to give me uh, three months of defacement data, so all the IP addresses that were listed as defaced on zoneage.org. These are mostly like script kitty little you know, hackers. Nothing, you know, most people who are doing something serious aren't going to deface the site and tell you that they're, they're in. They're just going to do what they're going to do. So look at this as the very bottom rung of just obvious defacements. And one thing you'll notice right away is defacements, which is actually a, a, the amplitude is at 100x zoom to make sure you can see it compared to the rest of the IP ranges. Everything else is one to one. Um, they can, you know, defacements correlate one to one with web servers. That's pretty obvious because you can't deface something that doesn't have a website on it. Uh, but if you start looking at how, what else correlates, you find some really fun uh, gaps here. What you'll see is that um, there'll be a lot of devices that have neither secure shell nor FTP, but are really high in defacements. So these things are only being defaced through things like Joomla, other kinds of web interfaces, PHP apps. They're not being hacked through like secure shell brute force or FTP bugs, things like that. Um, you do start looking at the services that expose and deface websites. I've got some other data that's not part of this deck. Um, it shows you like a really strong correlation between pro FTPD running and your site ending up in zoneh.org. And that's mostly because of the uh, ISPs that are getting defaced typically use pro FTPD as the version they run. So it's not a direct correlation based on vulnerability, but it's fun to look at you know, what services correlate to pre, post, and during compromise for sites that are listed in zone H. Um, one thing that's funny about this data set is you just grab all the HTTP data for the word hacked. You basically find most of the stuff that's in zone H, and about half of that stuff hasn't been fixed yet. It's just been out there for six months, or in some cases, four or five years, just the hacked website just hanging out out there. Um, you know, just poor Lord. I don't know where that server came from, but it's probably sitting in a wall someplace no one's looked at in years. Um, so is there anything else that jumps off in this graph? I think that was really it. You see some, a couple spikes here and there. Anytime you see these giant spikes, there's tend to be uh, large hosting providers that just can't get their stuff together, and all their servers keep getting compromised. Um, you see these huge spikes in those ranges, so if you're gonna host, don't host where the spikes are, basically. <laughs> uh, looking at UDP again, but this time focusing on MDNS and the VxWorks, um, you see your you know, SDP, UDP, NetBIOS, and so on. You see MDNS kind of all the way across the line there. MDNS is used by a lot of network devices. Uh, your TiVos, for example, your NAS devices, they'll expose MDNS, which is also known as Bonjour or Vahid, um, and they tell you all kinds of cool things about what other services are running on the same system. Um, so for example, it'll tell you, hey, I've got FTP and secure shell running on it. You don't even have to port scan me, I'll just tell you what's on there. So it's a great way to do like remote port scanning with only doing a single UDP probe. So a quick way to get a much more port information than you would otherwise. Nothing really jumps up too much in the set as far as correlations go, but the VxWorks side is scary because the VxWorks hits here, every one of these is an embedded device that has a debugger exposed to the world. Let's you read and write its memory and run arbitrary code. And it's 100x zoom, so you can see the amplitude of it. But at the same time, you see like these things aren't just all in you know, brick. They're not all in developing countries. They're not all in embedded devices. There's actually a pretty substantial number of them in the US and across the board. Um, these are vulnerabilities that were disclosed you know, two and a half years ago, 10 years ago. You actually want to go back to the very first report of it and still aren't really being fixed. And we'll go more to that data as we go forward. So last training graph, and I'll stop bothering you with these spark lines. But uh, here's an example of VNC, MySQL, SNTP, and Secure Shell. And if you look at VNC and MySQL, if you combine the two of them together, you get about the same number of results if you use Secure Shell. So for every you know, Secure Shell server box out there, you see it has half of a MySQL, half of a VNC sitting out there to the world too. And this doesn't even include uh, RDP, which is something around 80 or 90 million IPs. 
which is almost almost as popular as web if you actually take into, take into account. So you start getting into, okay, we've got some cool data, what can you do with it? Uh, SNP is great, SNP will tell you all kinds of terrible things. You can list routes, addresses, listing ports, running processes and services. I touched on this a little bit last night in AHA talk upstairs, so folks who saw that, bear with me on it. Um, you can do DDoS through amplification, so those 43 million web server, 43 million SDP devices can swing something like 100 terabit DDoS if you do amplification attacks on it. Just, they're great for reflecting giant amounts of data. Um, and you can enumerate things like software patches, user accounts, group names, things like that. Uh, on the Cisco, if you look at just Cisco devices that have SDP exposed, we publish the world. So the set of Cisco admins out there who don't know what they're doing left SDP exposed. Um, 18,000 of those things actually have private with a readable, writable string on it. So just wide open, rewrite the running configuration. You can sniff them, install rootkits, set up your own VLANs, whatever the hell you want to do. Um, so if you want to, you know, if you want to take over a large portion of the internet really quickly, all you have to do is, you know, find these, you know, spend seven bucks on a Russian VPS, scan for SNP, find the box that the private exposed to the world, and then use that to basically backdoor the running configuration files, and you have a Sky OS army of 18,000 nodes that you can then redirect any traffic anywhere you want. Um, and that doesn't take any technique or skill besides grabbing, you know, SNP walk from, you know, Linux app get and you're done. Uh, recently, uh, Kurt uh, Kratzmacher did a great uh, advisory on some vulnerabilities on Huawei and H3C routers. Uh, he found out that through SNP read-only alone, you can enumerate the usernames and passwords of those routers. So not just like, you know, username blah, 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 but the actual clear text and or hash password, depending on how it's configured. Um, and this is gnarly because you know, there's lots of these things out there, but 135,000 show up in my scan results so far. Um, and this is ignoring all the new zero day that uh, FX dumped at DEF CON. Um, you could use those, of course, to break in as well, but this is much easier just using command line tools. So if you look at uh, Huawei, and you, let's say I sampled the uh, 16,000 routers yesterday and had just dumped all the usernames and passwords and sorted them based on frequency. What you'll see is uh, 90, you know, 9,842 of admin is an uh, account on the system. You also see root, and then all these crazy ones starting with ly something. And these ly accounts are actually part of uh, whatever the service configuration is of these devices. These aren't configured by the user. These are built into the, whatever, however these things are being deployed. But as soon as you see the lys stop off, you start seeing kind of more normal sounding usernames again. Right after the 1001 ratio, you start seeing Huawei, Kristoff, uh, Conf Backup, Kiacho, SB, Call, Mots. You, you know, anyways, you start seeing more kind of, you know, definitely human generated ones. So that's how many service accounts are built into these routers by default. It's just ridiculous. And obviously not all of them, but a large portion of those routers exposed to the internet uh, do have these accounts installed that, you know, obviously weren't typed by hand. So let's say we wanted to log into all these routers. We'll look at all the passwords. So uh, 3,152 of these things have the password of 12345 for admin. <laughs> and that's 3,000 of 16,000, and apply that ratio to 135,000 to see how many routers you can pop pretty quick. And then you start going down the line, you see the same stuff. H3 cap admin's pretty popular. Uh, ZLang, blah, 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 um, admin, 123, 123. You see basically 1234 scattered all the way across the password list. Uh, on the right-hand side, these are passwords that I haven't cracked. They're just basically hash versions. And what's interesting about these is if you look at the, uh, the numbers, basically how many uh, occurrences of these same passwords occurred, you can see 866 routers have the exact same hash password. So obviously it's not a hard to crack password, it's just a password that every one of these routers has. These are probably all those LY service accounts uh, that map directly to um, accounts that the users probably don't even know exist. Um, as you start going down, you start seeing different versions of that and so on, but it's, it's pretty nasty in terms of uh, how much stuff is exposed right now just through SNP read-only access. Um, so moving that forward to uh, at Windows devices, we said let's look for every Windows device with SNP open to the world, figure out what version it's running, figure out what vulnerabilities it has, and start going through this. What you find is uh, 185,000 or so 2003 XP devices with SNP exposed to the world. Uh, you also find 140,581 Windows 2000 machines still exposed to the world through SNP. I mean, Windows 2000, it's been end of life for years, right? And it's still out there. You see about 3,400 2008 Windows 7, you see about uh, 1,285 Vista, and about 1,281 NT40 still out there. And you see seven NT351 guys who just won't die. They're just trucking along, they'll, they'll, they're immortal. One thing that um, SNP allows you to do in Windows is enumerate the arguments to running services, and oftentimes the services weren't, the service arguments are actually confidential, they shouldn't be exposed to anybody, but SNP will actually expose the, the arguments passed to the services as well, which includes tons of passwords. So you just grep for the word password after doing SNP walk on all these devices, you get probably a thousand clear text passwords that I found in probably 20 minutes. Um, you see some examples here, you see RDP logins, secure shell logins, retail backend logins, uh, database logins, uh, all sorts of really fun, nasty stuff just sitting out there. Uh, in some cases, you found law enforcement gear where the logins to the Juniper routers for doing NetFlow taps, or NetTapD or whatever it's called, were actually configured in the service arguments as well. 
So you can just use SMP walk to grab the passwords, use the passwords to go log into the router, use the routers to then monitor whoever you want at the ISP. And of course, they're in the very worst possible place for monitoring because they're there because of Kalia. And so UPnP, I talked about it a little bit before, but basically it's, you know, millions of devices out there have a service exposed with very few no, uh, number of software versions involved. Um, you can download the source to the Intel SDK, you can go through it all, you can find lots of vulnerabilities. I don't know why it's been ignored for so long, but it's, it's pretty gnarly. Uh, going back to VxWorks again, this is something I played with back in 2010. Uh, I scanned the entire internet trying to figure out how many VxWorks devices had the debugger exposed to the world, and I found about 250,000 or so. This thing let you do read-write access to the devices, you could uh, do like save game hacking where you find a device, you dump its memory, you make a configuration change to it, you dump it again, you do a diff with the memory, and you figure out what you have to modify in memory to then backdoor another running device. And we'll do an example demo of that real quick. Um, so if you rescan uh, the entire internet again after, you know, basically in 2012, uh, most recently, you find there's still 200,000 of these devices still out there. And we, we released advisories for 112 different vendors. We contacted uh, US CERT, worked with these guys for about 90 days just to get things up and running. Uh, spent a lot of time hand-holding different SCADA vendors, different PLC vendors, uh, different electric companies, lots of power utilities, lots of embedded devices, and it didn't make a lick of difference. We're still just as screwed as we were before. Um, those 50,000 probably just caught on fire or something like that. I can't imagine they're actually patched. Um, I think this is more accidental than the results of any actual you know, security changes out there. Um, so I feel like you know, even if you do everything just right as a security researcher and you expose a vulnerability and you make a big noise about it and you get articles written and you do all this work, you add it to Metasploit, um, you don't really have that much of an impact in the real world. <laughs> I know, we're useless. <laughs> I mean, it's still fun, and the people who actually can keep ahead of the bear are great, but you know, there's a whole army of people still be eaten by bears behind us. Um, <laughs> this video might work, let's see if it goes. There it goes. This is an example of a, a video conferencing unit that is, uh, there's still about 450,000 of these things scattered across the world. They've been end of life for a long time. Here you can see the setting saying that uh, all is answering coming calls is turned off. And then I'm going to hit it with a VxWorks attack that basically resets the global setting and memory through the debugger, dial into it, start you know, listening to the conversation in the room, looking at the video feed of the device, um, and then after it hangs up, you'll see it go back into the settings, see that flag has not been enabled in the UI, even though the user didn't do anything. So that was me dialing into it real quick. You look at the general settings again, and yep, now it's set to all those answering coming calls. You can also set the ringer down. You can turn off any kind of notification to the user. You can disable the LEDs, uh, because you're basically messing with the raw physical memory of the device when it's running. So you need some really cool kind of save game, save, save game style hacking these devices. Even if you don't know anything at all about how to do embedded development, you can just go dump, diff, poke, done. Uh, and we've got some other fun attacks for pulling passwords out of Apple access points, things like that, by grepping the amount of memory through the debugger. So and this is 250,000 devices, now 200,000 devices have this type of vulnerability exposed where you can just do anything you want to the memory of the system. Uh, again, another example real quick is MySQL. Uh, found about three million MySQL servers exposed to the internet with no firewall in front of 3306. Uh, about 1.5 million of those things have apples that say, you know, this host can't log in, so at least you can't brute force them. Uh, but the other 1.5 million don't. You can just brute force root all day long if you want to. Um, and there's lots of vulnerabilities. Like, you look at some of the versions out there, and you know there's definitely some vulnerabilities based on version alone. And then you start looking at things like the authentication bypass flaw that was released back in June. And the nice thing about the bypass flaw is if you just try to log into MySQL, and if you can't do it, you just try again. Eventually, it lets you in. Uh, one out of 256 times will accidentally let you log in with a bad password. Uh, so you just keep on trying until MySQL says, okay, here's your shell, thanks. Uh, so we ran through, and this is a little bit tricky to get stats on, but you have to fingerprint the OS, the architecture, the version number, uh, the package name, and the actual banner itself. So we ran through this huge data set of 1.5 million boxes, identified all the possible Ubuntu boxes, fingerprinted the architecture through Nmap, uh, and found out there's around 90,000 servers still vulnerable two months later to the internet. So if you want to talk about like data loss, um, all you have to do is run MySQL dump in a loop on the server until it lets you log in and dump it and you're done. So yay, hacking, it's, it's hard. Uh, and if, why would you bother with a web app if you go straight to the database and just dump all the records in one shot? So it's one of those ways to kind of bypass every other layer of security and just go straight to what you want. Uh, F5 is pretty similar in that they had about 13,500 devices exposed to the internet that I could think of as being F5 uh, configuration systems. Apologies to whoever's from F5 here. Uh, about 50% 50, 50 of those devices have scarce open to the world and they accidentally shipped a private key that was added to their authorized keys file on the box to all their customers. So every customer had a remote root login to every other customer through the private key that was on the appliance itself, and they gave away the, v the virtual hard drive file online without logging in, so anybody who just off the internet could walk up, grab the VMDK file, grab the special private key, and then mass log in every F5 box out there. So they, 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 you know, they're aware of this thing, they made a big stink about it, there's an advisory, 
Um, I grabbed the, when the advisory was first published, the researcher published the public key, not the private key, or the one that was added. And there's a neat module on Metasploit that lets you actually use just a public key only to do authentication scanning of secure shell servers. You can say, will you accept this public key when I log into you? And it says, oh yeah. And it's like, okay, well now sign this thing. You say, nope, thanks. Now I know the public key works. So using just the public key, you can find out whether you've accessed a machine without actually using the private key to go with it. It's great if you have a terminated employee, you want to make sure the keys are being locked out great properly. It's a neat, you know, neat technique in general. Um, so this is remote root if the key's enabled. Um, we use the SH to identify pub keys module, ran it across all 13,500 devices that I found out there uh, with a pub key. So it didn't actually try to do authentication, just did half authentication to it using the pub key only. And 721 uh, devices were still exposed two months later. Um, so 10% of the boxes will probably never get patched. And you don't find F5 big IPs where they aren't important because they're expensive and they go, you know, they generally do things like terminate your SSL. Uh, so if you can shell in as root to a box that terminates SSL for a bank and then just sniff it, you're done. It's like, thanks, that was, that was real hard. So if you look at like, just very bottom low hanging fruit attacks out there, this is an, an easy one that would probably, you know, result in who knows what if someone actually got it in their head to exploit it. Um, I can't imagine that anyone would think of that now. Uh, but. Anyways, the F5 guys have actually been good about it. We've been in touch about trying to find more servers, trying to contact you know, all the various customers. They're having trouble getting their customers to actually make the changes. They're, they're very much aware of the problem themselves. Um, the last thing I want to talk about a little bit is randomness and what, you know, things that should be random but aren't and so on. Uh, so I like looking at NetBIOS, for example. Um, most folks think MAC addresses are fairly unique. I mean, they're supposed to be unique. The vendor's supposed to manage the, the Ethernet address pool, 48 bits. They get their own little chunk through OUI prefixes. They manage all the MAC addresses for all their network cards and Bluetooth and things like that. Um, so MAC addresses have been considered unique by vendors because that's how you do port locking, that's how you do Wi-Fi SSID stuff, that's how you do all sorts of things are based on MAC addresses for uniqueness. Um, software licensing keys, Windows activation keys. Um, so of about 21 million NetBIOS services that are found so far, um, not that many of them are unique. Um, you can actually see that Huawei has something about 285,000 uh, uh, machines on the internet with the same MAC address or the duplicate. So those machines can't ever be on the same network because they just won't talk to each other. They have the same freaking Mac. This, I mean, it's busted. They broke, it, they broke Ethernet. Uh, Qualcomm, same thing. Asus, same thing. VMware, a ton of them, of course, but, Asus, but VMware uses virtual you know, NICs, so that's why there are duplicates. Um, HP, Dell, Honda, Microsoft, Intel. So no one's really immune from this. All the vendors who are providing network equipment actually are reissuing the same Mac addresses to different people's equipment, hoping they'll never meet in the same network ever. Um, but it's pretty obvious that that's not the case. One thing that's neat about MAC addresses, if you ever see a Windows machine with MAC address uh, 005345 and all zeros, that's Windows XP's dial-up networking adapter. So you know it's on a dial-up, you know it's XP. Just by the MAC address, you get back to NetBIOS. Uh, same thing for uh, 4445, that's Windows 98. And if you basically just grab for those MAC addresses and showed them, you can find a, a listing of all the dial-up machines running Windows, connected to the internet with a firewall, running XP or 98. So there's an example of about 32,000 machines. This one's called FBI something and it's in Moscow. <laughs> Kind of odd. Uh, so the next thing we we'll talk about is more kind of app and web stuff. It's very much like if you look at every, let's say you scan, you know, you made a get request for forward slash of every web server on the internet, and you looked at the set cookie parameter coming back, and then you took all those set cookies that look like sesh IDs and you just sort on them based on uh, the key value itself. Then you found out which one of those actually weren't unique. Um, you can find some really neat things. So here's an example of looking at IS uh, ASP session IDs. If you go across 145 million web servers, you find out that there's about you know, 500, 600 of these IS servers have the same session ID. It doesn't make any sense. So you start looking through where these things are, they're all in China, and they're all scattered across all the different uh, China Telecom, Ubicom, whatever networks out there. Um, and what's interesting about these is these aren't actually IS. These are fake monitoring devices put in place by the Chinese uh, telecom folks, um, and so the management interfaces have these things, and they're faking the IS session key for some reason. They all have the same session key to log in. Um, so they're not really IS, but they use IS style session keys, but they forgot to randomize them. Um, anyways, it's interesting that there's 300 boxes out there that are nowhere near each other geographically, but have the exact same session ID for what looks like an IS server, but isn't. Um, neat stuff. This is an example of uh, two application frameworks that have some serious problems with session management. Uh, Rack, part of Ruby on Rails, um, has the same key in a lot of cases. You also see a lot of, a lot of issues with Rail, Ruby on Rails applications. There's a great presentation being done by uh, a gentleman named Jorn Chen. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, I think it's like Hack, hack Night, something like that is where it's going to happen. But he found basically this massive cryptological vulnerability in how Ruby on Rails generates sessions for some people, for some use cases. Um, and he's got a great cracker that just goes through and logs in as whatever. So I won't go into too much on that side because it's his talk, but 
Um, you can easily see just by searching for um, Ruby on Rails style cookies like underscore federal underscore session, you see duplicate session is already popping up here. Uh, anybody, so if anyone who writes Python is going, yeah, Ruby sucks, wah! Well, um, Twisted Framework, also known for almost all um, Python-based network services, is a great framework for doing that, has the same problem with entropy with its sessions. So you can look at all these sessions here, even though there's only three or four duplicates, these duplicates are nowhere near each other geographically or ownership-wise. These are not related to it at all. They just happen to have the exact same number. So something is seriously wrong with Twisted Framework entropy for session generation, and you only find out when you actually start sorting out 145 million servers and find out which ones have, have conflicts. So even though these look like you know, nice long MD5 hashes, they, they're conflicting. There's three or four servers that are unrelated to each other have the same key. So there's something majorly wrong with Twisted. I don't know what version, whether it's already fixed or what. This is just kind of data coming straight from the scan results. Same thing applies to network devices. You find uh, devices out there that have really crappy session keys. This RG cookie session ID applies to these ADSL modems, and they just use long integers, and there's, they conflict. These are probably 32-bit integers. They're probably not to be treated just as decimal. Um, and you'll see that 10 machines have the exact same session ID being given out, uh, these little DSL modems. So obviously, there's something really wrong with the sessions there, too. So it's a great way to kind of shake zero day out of the internet is by looking at anything that's duplicate that shouldn't be a duplicate. Um, same thing applies to Cisco application control. You can see these ACE cookies are supposed to be unique. They're obviously not. Um, some really what weird ones that popped up. This is actually a, kind of a, a question for the audience, really. You see a lot of PHP servers on the internet have the exact same session ID being spit out. And the session ID applies not just to PHP, but to a whole suite of other applications are sending the same static session ID across. And it doesn't make any sense why. And I tried, to, I figured maybe, maybe this is like a known MD5 sum for some weird string that has to be common when there's a bug in the application. But the string is a CF91390F5544. You can pull it from the slides later, email me. Um, but if you grep for this one session ID across huge amounts of data, you find hits everywhere. You find all these different devices, all these different web app frameworks, mostly PHP though, spitting out this non-unique session ID. And every server that I found so far was out of disk space and spitting out errors about it, if you actually browse to it. So it could be that if PHP runs out of disk space, its session generator somehow breaks and now it's spitting out a static session ID for everything else, which is neat. If that's, that's actually the case, then great, go fill up the disk of a web server and then wait for the admin to log in to steal their session. So there's actually some neat attacks you can do based on that. So again, this is mostly just you know, based on observance, no idea what code path this affects, what version it affects, just that there's a whole lot of them out there and there really shouldn't be. Um, if we can dig into the data in a little bit for this time. Uh, let's see. I don't think you can look at it as e-tag headers. So e-tag headers tell you what the particular file's been changed the last time it was cached. Um, pretty straightforward. E-tags are supposed to be unique for particular content. And if you start looking at how many um, e-tags are out there and start doing uh, sorts based on the uniqueness of e-tags, you find uh, default configurations of web servers very easily because they all have the same e-tag, with the same content, with the same hash. So you can find uh, copies of every IS70 and 7.5 box out there. And 7.5, these are different language packs. So you can actually differentiate between the language pack of the IS server based just on the e-tag of the default content coming down the pike. Um, the same thing actually applies to patching a bunch of Linux distributions as well. Based on the e-tag value coming in, you know this is Red Hat, this is Ubuntu, it's got exactly this patch up level on it because of the default web page. You don't even have to look at the server header for it. It could be completely hidden or behind mod security for all you care, but that e-tag will actually tell you the rest of it. Uh, so there's a couple stats real quick because you can't do a talk about web server stats, I'll talk about user agents. Um, one thing I want to point out here is if you look at unique uh, agents of about 200 million, 35 million is the data set I started with for this, of 200 million total is still exporting when I got to it. Um, you see that there's uh, 8.1 million ROM pagers, web servers. Those are all those embedded devices out there. Then you got Akamai, then you get Apache, then you get Nginx, and so on. Then you see more go ahead webs, more ROM pager, most Cisco iOS. Um, but in general, there's actually more embedded web servers out there than there are real web servers out there uh, in terms of what the exposure of the web to the world is. I thought that was kind of an interesting finding that it was like that. Um, if you want to look at by the powered by headers and look at popularity here, you see tons of PHP, of course. They're the ones who kind of started off with the powered by headers to start with. Uh, but, you know, PHP 4.3.2 RC1 is ancient, and there's 18,000 servers right there saying, yeah, I'm PHP 4.3.2, come throw exploits at me. Um, and that, you know, all the fun Zen 16-bit uh, reference counter vulnerabilities apply to that, just lots and lots of terrible bugs. So if you look at kind of what our overall health of the internet is based on just banners, we're pretty screwed. So I'll finish that with some of the funny stuff out there. Once in a while you just find weird things. Here's some of the powered by lines that, you know, I got a chuckle out of when I ran across. Uh, the teeny tiny organic cage-free hamsters powered by line was pretty funny. So anyways, good creativity out there. Um, but uh, that's well finished, and hopefully I'll have time for a couple questions. Uh, so let's talk so far. Uh, I think just before we go to the questions piece, uh, one piece on just kind of conclusions wrapping this up is if you start looking at the internet as a whole is not just this you know, you know, mysterious thing that you can't really get your head around, but basically a big bucket of bits you can go dig into, uh, you can start finding really interesting vulnerabilities just by shaking things out, looking for duplicate values, things like that. 
Um, if you're going to do your own internet-wide reconnaissance, it's really cheap. It's like five or ten bucks to get it up and running. Uh, and you can scan any single port for that pretty easily. Um, and the internet as a whole is pretty much screwed. Like we're in a really bad state. We may do a really good job of securing our own networks and doing a good job of locking in our applications, but our neighborhoods are turning into cesspools. Like it's just it's terrible out there. Um, and it's not you know limited to very you know to particular regions or BRIC countries or something like that. They're very much normalized across the rest of the, you know the entire global IP space. Um, and you can easily find entropy problems just by looking for duplicates and large sets of data like this and start you know digging out vulnerabilities that way. Uh, so thanks for your time. If you want to get a hold of me after this for some reason, um, there's my contact info. Uh, you can find me on IRC or Twitter or you know, wrap up an email. Uh, but thanks again, and we'll do questions right after the other side. Thanks, guys.